Well, happy Sabbath, everyone, and good evening. And uh, thank you for coming to the study this evening. Uh, we're going to continue reading from 1888 Reexamined by uh, Robert Wieland and Donald K. Short. And um, it's been really enlightening, even though there's some differences that I have in their views. Um, they're giving us a lot of good background information that every Seventh-day Adventist should know. And this here, uh, this part dealing with Ellen White's ministry and what happened to her trip you know, to Australia, why she ended up, ended up in Australia. It's not often well known, right, uh, what actually ended up happening. The church doesn't really go through this uh, this kind of history generally. But anyway, before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and the blessings of this past week, the way that you work in our lives, even through our trials and difficulties. And we know, Lord, that as we seek you each morning, and as we talk to you throughout the day, um, that you continue to teach us lessons that we need to learn, sometimes difficult lessons. Uh, but we know, Lord, that um, your purpose is to have us develop a Christ-like character, to understand love and compassion, uh, the love that uh, Christ had for us and that we can have through Christ for others. We pray that you can be with us this evening as we read, um, as we read about Ellen White's ministry and what happened to her after 1888, and as we look at the parallels that are happening in this movement today. So we just ask for your continued uh, blessings and your presence. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath and good evening again. Now, we, we did have an interesting week. Um, you know, Elder Jeff was on with the uh, American group on Sabbath. And um, that was 1,260 days after July 18, 2020. I don't think he intentionally thought about it when he joined the Canadian group, but it's definitely significant, uh, the timing of that event. And the renunciation of July 18, 2020 in a public way um, and the rejection of the symbolic uses of numbers and dates. So it's obviously um, a watershed moment in this movement, and it's definitely going to affect the American and Canadian groups as people uh, begin to take sides. I mean, I, I, I believe that the majority will end up following Jeff again, but... There will be some that won't, and um, we need to pray for everyone in the movement. Now, of course, those types of things that happen, the rejection of a message, we can see that there's a parallel uh, to what happened in 1888. The type of manner, the, the way in which a message is, is addressed, the way that the people are, are dealt with, um, when truth is presented uh, and you have nothing to to oppose the truth except misrepresentation and character assassination. And that's, of course, is the way that humanity is. We're all like that. We're no different than the people in Minneapolis in 1888 who um, received light and had to decide what to do with it. Now, um, so this section uh, called Ellen White's Ministry Disparaged, um, it's got some pretty difficult things to, to think about. But let's let's read it and we'll discuss some of these things. And people remember, if you have a comment to make or a question or you want to correct me, feel free to do so. Um, the attitude of leadership to Ellen White's support of the 1888 message was similar to that of ancient Israel and Judah to prophets such as Elijah and Jeremiah. Note her frank remarks shortly after the Minneapolis conference. I have not had an easy time since I left the Pacific coast. Our first meeting was not like any other general conference I ever attended. My testimony was ignored 
and never in my life experience was I treated as at the 1888 conference. Brethren, you are urging me to come to your camp meetings. I must tell you plainly that the course pursued toward me and my work since the general conference at Minneapolis, your resistance of the light and warnings that God has given through me, has made my labor 50 times harder than it would otherwise have been. It seems to me that you have cast aside the word of the Lord as unworthy of your notice. My experience since the conference at Minneapolis has not been very assuring. I have asked the Lord for wisdom daily and that I may not be utterly disheartened and go down to the grave brokenhearted as did my husband. These were not the words of a woman who was overwrought emotionally. She had good reason. She had good reason for her feelings. I related in the Thursday morning meeting at Ottawa, Kansas, and um, I believe that um, the Ottawa, Kansas there, that's going to be the Topeka, Kansas daily capital uh, that reports on these meetings. I've read those uh, presentations that were taken by the uh, reporter. Um, but anyway, she says, I related in the Thursday morning meeting in Ottawa, Kansas, some things in reference to the Minneapolis meeting. God gave me meat in due season for the people, but they refused it, for it did not come in just the way and manner they wanted it to come. Elders Jones and Wagner presented precious light to the people, but prejudice and unbelief, jealousy and evil surmising barred the door of their hearts, that nothing from this source should find entrance to their hearts. And thus it was in the betrayal, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus. All this had passed before me, point by point, and the satanic spirit took the control and moved with power upon the human hearts that had been opened to doubts and to bitterness, wrath and hatred. All this was prevailing at that meeting at Minneapolis. I was conducted to the house where our brethren made their homes, and there was much conversation and excitement of feelings and some smart and and as they were supposed sharp, witty remarks. So smart being a, like a smart aleck. Um, the servants whom the Lord sent were caricatured, ridiculed, and placed in a ridiculous light. The comment passed upon me and the work that God had given me to do was anything but flattering. Willie White's name was handled freely and he was ridiculed and denounced. Also the names of Elder Jones and Wagner. Now, you know, this is what I call schoolyard talk, you know, this, the way that people can, can treat one another. And we have to really guard ourselves especially if we, we feel that we're hurt by someone. Because, you know, really it's it's God who's the one that's being ridiculed. And, you know, to take it personally as if it's something to do with us is, is wrong, right? It's, it's really the truth and God that are being ridiculed. And, and people choose us as the targets, or we choose other people as the targets. If we use God as the target, it would be much more obvious that we're rejecting God, right? So, so we think that we can reject the truth by rejecting the messengers, by belittling them, and, and that somehow that justifies it. But the truth is the truth, and so we have to be very careful. Uh, voices that I was surprised to hear were joining in this rebellion, hard, bold, and decided in denouncing Sister White. And of all those so free and forward with their cruel words, not one had come to me and inquired if these reports and their suppositions were true. After hearing what I did, my heart sank within me. I had never pictured before my mind what dependence we might place in those who claim to be friends when the spirit of Satan finds entrance to their hearts. I thought of the future crisis and feelings that I can never put into words for a little time overcame me. The, thy, the brother shall betray the brother to death. I mean, this is a pretty hard thing to read when you think about it. Because, I mean, we know she's comparing it to what happened to Christ. And this happened to Sister White and this happened to God's messengers. 
and it happens still today. Like the idea that we can talk about somebody without going to them. You know, whenever I have a conflict with a person, I write that person or I phone them or I talk to them. And sometimes people don't want to hear, right? But if you if you have a problem with someone or somebody even has a problem with you, you know, you, you have to follow the counsel given in God's word. Uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, attack the person. It would not be fair to characterize Ellen White's heart reaction to this as emotional or that of Jones and Wagner. But all three were human beings with hearts that could be wounded. And all three felt pain and grief, as did the ancient prophets. Ellen White in particular sensed keenly the premonitions of the final persecution of the saints. She actually used the word persecution to describe the heart attitude of leading brethren toward the 1888 messengers. On the other hand, it was a puzzle to the sincere brethren of that era how she could support two apparently faulty young men against the calm, stolid judgment of nearly all the established leaders and ministers. If balance was needed, why did she support the apparently unbalanced? Why did she liken the brethren's reaction against Jones and Wagner's message to the Jews' reaction against Christ? The 1888 opposition was composed of good, sincere, self-sacrificing, hardworking ministers. Their concern for the progress of the church was genuine. It was their fear that this beautiful vision of Christ's righteousness would lead to fanaticism. But this fear calcified human hearts. There seems only one way to understand this mysterious reaction. A careful study of Ellen White's numerous statements indicates that it was the revelation of the breadth and length and depth and height of Christ's love, puts there agape, that our dear um, hardworking brethren were instinctively opposing. The love revealed at the cross constrains us, constraineth us, so that the believers henceforth find it impossible to go on living for self. Second Corinthians 5, verse 14 and 15. The profound truth seems to be that this kind of devotion to Christ, this closer intimacy with him, was unwelcome. Now, I want to address this point because this is something that I'm not a fan of when it comes to um, Wheeland and Short. And part of what I've seen through the years with how it was interpreted, what Jones and Wagner were presenting, um, is this idea of this motive of love. We talked about it in the other studies before. It's just that if we can see God's love, Christ's love for us, that this is going to motivate us to follow him. And I don't think that that's correct. I mean, I'm not saying that knowing God's love, that that isn't a byproduct of surrender to Christ. You, you come to experience his love. But I think the problem is, um, and maybe it's just, maybe it could just be semantics, just arguing over words here. Uh, but the real problem is, that we are not love. That is, it's true. We love Christ because he first loved us, right? So that means that Christ can fill our hearts with love. And that's part of the conversion process. Part of being converted is we learn to love the unlovely, not just loving God. We learn to love as Christ loved. But it is something that it's not our love. It's not that we we somehow we see Christ and he's so wonderful and that we just respond in love because we're not love. Christ is love. God is love. We are not. When we see the impossibility of us being able to represent Christ on our own, that this is part of the problem why people resist. People want to see themselves as good. And I've seen it many times, people who profess to believe the ATP message talk about this love, but not show it. Okay, you have a question there, Kelly? I had my, yeah, I had my hand up there. I just don't want to wait any yeah. longer. Yeah, well, don't put the um, hand up because look at it. Oh, I, I don't see that. Jump in. I see. So <laughs> jump in. <laughs> there we go. Jumping now. Yeah. Uh, 
talking, speaking about love and, and love not being enough in terms of uh, changing us, convicting us, uh, getting us to obey even. Because mm-hmm. I've been overwhelmed with the love of God. Honestly, the love and the mercy that I've seen in the midst of, of my turmoil and choices of bad stuff and still knowing God loves me. But it wasn't enough to change what I was doing. Now, what's with that, right? I, I describe it as as being on the on the shore of a, a beach, and the waves are coming in. They don't stop. They never stop. There's there's a wave pattern, or what we call, you know, beat or breaking up yeah. on the shores of my heart. The love, the love of God, waves of God's love and mercy over my head crashing on the shores of my heart and still it doesn't lock me in place now what is that that's that's a, well, something i'm thinking about here why not why isn't it and you were saying so but yeah. you're saying so in so many words what do you think it is to just tell me okay so i did i did a series of sermons on god's love um on sabbath you know few uh, over the last month or whatever. Are you telling and, me to go back and listen to it? <laughs> but I did. Oh, yeah, so okay. Sorry. I'm just going to tell you the essence of, of those. Um, the whole the whole point that I was trying to make is that that we are not God. God is love. We are not. We are unlovely and unloving, right? We have nothing to recommend us to God. And we can't, we can't, We can't respond to God's love because we have nothing in us really to do that, right? If you understand what I mean. Yeah, it ain't nothing good in us. Yeah, there's no good thing. We don't. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. So, so, so God has worked in our life. He has brought us through experiences, right? Now, first, we come to God, we get justification. We we see that God has forgiven us, and that's the first thing we that we experience once we see ourselves as a sinner. We go to God, we ask for forgiveness, yeah. and he gives us, right? Like, and he's not, it's not conditional forgiveness. Yeah, it's not conditional. He's not saying, well, I'll forgive you if, you know. He's just, I forgive yeah. you. I accept you. Don't go to buy a ticket, you're already in. But the work is not accomplished yet, Right? There's still a work that he has to do. And that is, so he's going to... around for that work to be done is the part where my struggle, I guess, is. Maybe the struggle of every man, but... It's the work of a lifetime. We love, we're, we're convicted. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So we, we want to have something where we go to God, we get forgiveness, and now we're going to be good and we can see ourselves as good, right? That's what That's what we want. We want to have righteousness in ourselves, our own righteousness. You know, it's good God forgave us. You know, it's a good thing that he did that. But now that he's forgiven me, I want to be righteous, right? I want to see myself as righteous. I want to be, and and that's where I don't like this message because I don't, this idea about responding with love to God's love because we have nothing to, we have no love in us, right? Honestly, so the whole thing about yeah, being in Jones and the process, the other thing about the process of it of it being a lifetime is that there's no stopping and resting on our laurels. Well, and and the thing is, we're so far from God, we don't even know how far from God we are. We don't even know how unchristlike we are. And so, what God, what the Christian life is, is to say. On a daily basis, oh wretched man that I am, who who can deliver me from the body of this death, right? That is to be our experience daily. That is no dependence upon self. God is life. We're death, right? Um, the carnal mind With, is uh, the favorite, God, right? a, a favorite reading of mine. Speaking to that experience, is a uh, the experience that was it Moses? Uh, okay, woe is me for I'm a man undone of unclean lips. That was Isaiah. And Ellen yeah. White speaks of that experience. Ellen White speaks of that experience that he had that we, every one of us, must have the experience that Isaiah had. 
That's <laughs> similar to what you're saying. And it's, and it's a daily experience. It's not like you can have that experience one day and then that's it. Right. Right. Yeah. The Christian yeah. life yeah. is life. The Christian life is a life of suffering. A battle and a march. But it is a life of suffering where, in in a sort of ironic sense, we can have healing. We can have peace. It's it's a battle, but we can be at peace in the midst of the battle. And and the problem is is that we keep we keep thinking that somehow I'm going to make it to a point where. I can I can just sort of trust in my own righteousness. We don't think of it that way, like it, express it that way. But deep down inside, that's what we want. We want to see ourselves as good, right? So we get converted, we join a church, we become leaders and pastors, and we're ministering to people and telling people, you know, about God's love and stuff. And and we think hmm, that that means I'm good now. But we need utter and total dependence upon God. So we can't respond in love. To God in from anything that comes from us. Any love that we have is just God's love. God's love is being returned to him when we love those around us. And that that's the miracle of the Christian life. And and so lots of times people, you know, think that, you know, somehow we see God's love and then we respond in love. But I, I don't see that. I, I really don't. I, I think that's a false gospel. It, it has false expectations. And, and when I see people preaching that message, they always seem to have behind it that somehow they have experienced this, right? Well, to me, it's no well, different than seeing that I'm in. perfect, right? I'm What's gonna that? Jump I'm going to jump in there. I say, I'm going to jump in yeah. there and comment on, on your thought and idea. And I agree about there be no love within the heart of a man to give back to God that God has given unless God has given. The other thing is that we can give, and I suppose it is put in our hearts perhaps, but I, I do believe it's a sincere response that comes from within our heart, and that is to give thanks always mm -hmm. in all things. Right. Yeah, we should. I mean, that's what to me is thankfulness. We give our thankfulness and our praise to God because that's showing that everything comes from God, right? We're, we're not, we're not showing our love to God as if we have some love to give, but we do have gratefulness and thankfulness. Well, it's about like, it's about like Jesus had to depend on the father to give him the love and, and the uh, courage to do what he did. Yeah, everything he said came from the Father. He, That's he, right. His own character, you know, his mm -hmm. own love, his own power. He trusted in the Father. And God is teaching us to trust in him in spite of everything that we see happening around us and in spite of what we see in ourselves, because we are not to see ourselves as righteous. That That is not something that ever will happen. There's more Even in we're not going to see ourselves as righteous. Righteousness is something that comes from God alone. And now God can declare us righteous and, and we can represent his character, but it's all from God. It's nothing to do with us. And and this, I think, is, is the, the main problem that I've seen with this message that differs from what Jones and Wagner presented. Because Jones and Wagner never present this idea that they, that, Wheeland in short present and that other people have presented this response of love. I've never seen that. In, and we, we actually went through uh, Jones 1893 and 1895 General Conference Bulletin sermons. And he's quite clear that that is not what happens. But it just somehow it sounds good. And so people keep saying it. But it's not part of Jones and Wagner's message. Anyway, let's let's go on and read here. A careful study of Ellen White's numerous statements indicates that it was the revelation of the breadth, length, and depth and height of Christ's love that our hard, hard, hardworking brethren were instinctively opposing. Now, now it is true that they are opposing God's love, but they're opposing it because of what it it means about them. Right. The reason why men love darkness rather than light is because their deeds are evil and they don't want their deeds to be exposed. 
right? We don't want to see ourselves as bad. The love revealed at the cross constraineth us so that the believer henceforth, believers henceforth find it impossible to go on living for self. And that is true, right? The profound truth seems to be that this kind of devotion to Christ, this closer intimacy with him was unwelcome. The reason why it's unwelcome is because it exposes who we are, right? So to know Christ is, is not to have this wonderful, you know, experience this sort of ecstatic happiness that people think that they're going to get in knowing Christ. When you know Christ, you know of his sufferings, you participate in his sufferings. And that's because his love, his truth that, that shines into you shows you that you, you're experiencing that death to self. That's not a pleasant thing. And so people aren't, don't find that welcome. It's unwelcome. Here was evidence that all might discern whom the Lord recognized as his servants. But there are those who despise the men and the message they bore. They have taunted them with being fanatics, extremists, and enthusiasts. Enthusiasts, And that's Testimonies to Ministers, page 97. These men, the opposition, have been holding positions of trust and have been molding the work after their own similitude as far as they possibly could. So this is part of the things in, in my sermons on love, too, that like man has their idea of how things should be. And they're completely opposite of how God thinks they should be. So man has all their ideas about, you know, how to do things. But God has different ideas because these are after his character. Our ideas are after our own character, right? So if we're molding the work after our own character, similitude, we're not going to be happy about somebody saying what we're doing is wrong. They have been zealously declaiming against enthusiasm and fanaticism. Faith that God has enjoined upon his people to exercise is called fanaticism. But if there is anything upon the earth that should inspire men with sanctified zeal, it is the truth as it is in Jesus. Christ made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. If there's anything in our world that should inspire enthusiasm, it is the cross of Calvary. Thus we are brought to the foot of Christ's cross. Here is the mysterious continental divide in Adventism, where faith and unbelief go their separate ways. Of all human beings, the gospel minister or administrator faces the most subtle temptation to indulge a disguised love of self. Unless he surveys that wondrous cross and casts contempt upon all his professional and personal pride, he will unconsciously resist the agape revealed there. John Bunyan in The Pilgrim's Progress saw hard by the very gate of heaven, there is a path that leads to hell. Ellen White did not consider Jones or Wagner, Wagner's presentations to be either extreme or radical, but tried to reason with the brethren who thought they were. Widely published statements such as the following perpetuate a myth. Mrs. White did not endorse the ideas advanced by Elder Wagner concerning Galatians. She even seemed to have a feeling that the two men were so prominent at that time that who were so prominent at that time might later be carried away by their extreme views of certain points. So this is a book by Christian uh, that you looked at earlier. So her remarks were not directed against any extreme views. Wagner had. Instead of charging him with being radical or extreme, she intimates that some of his views were immature. There was not perfection. In God's plan, this immaturity was to be overcome by faithful, earnest digging in the minds of God for the precious ore. The light that shone in 1888 was only the beginning of the light, which was to lighten the earth with glory. Such glorious light began to shine through imperfect, but divinely chosen channels. And of course, this is true of, of God using any person. If God uses us, he uses us in spite of who we are. And, and obviously there's a part of us that's, that's still there. And, and there are things that people can pick at. There's things we don't understand fully. But we sometimes speak of things that we haven't really understood. 
And that's basically the most that you can say that Ellen White said against Jones and Wagner in this, in as far as their message is concerned. Now, and this thing about law in Galatians, we are going to go through um, the two books on Galatians, that is uh, Butler's book and uh, Wagner's response. So one of the things that we see in, uh, in, in Wagner's and Jones view is that the law in Galatians is the moral law. Now, it does also include the ceremonial law, and Ellen White makes this clear as well. But it's the main emphasis is the moral law. When we're not under the law, it doesn't mean we're not under the ceremonial law. It means we're not under the moral law, right? That is, to be under the law means to be under its condemnation, right? So Christ was made of a woman made under the law that he might redeem those that are under the law. He didn't die for Jews. He died for sinners, right? And and this idea, this distinction of the moral and ceremonial law was used in in that period of time in arguing against the, the opponents of the, the Sabbath, right? So they would say, well, we're no longer under the law, right? We don't have to keep the Sabbath. And the argument was, well, that's the ceremonial law, you know, which, of course, it's not talking about. It's talking about the moral law. And, and I made those mistakes early as an Adventist too, th- you know, believing that, that idea. Anyway, we're going to, we'll get back to that when we get to uh, the two books on Galatians. It was not God's plan that one or two men should do all the digging. Is that true today? Didn't God call a movement to study his word, to understand Millerite history? The thing I liked about this movement when I joined it in 2010 is that it was a movement. It wasn't just people following Jeff and him having all of the light. And we just, you know, you know, his syncophants, syncophants, you know, just accepting everything he said. Right. At least light was coming from all different quarters within the movement. And Jeff was willing to look at a different light and he, he would have us address that. We would study it. We would study it out. Now, he's taken the position recently that he should never have done that, that he should have stayed as the prophet and just be the where the light came from. Now, he didn't say it exactly in that words, but if you read his articles, that's what he's saying. And that that listening to all these different voices got the movement off course. But, of course, we don't see anything like that in Millerite history except after October 22, 1844, where, you know, and it's maybe not quite the same, but it's similar, right? We see that Jeff is fulfilling the role of Miller. Anyway, so this this idea that not one or two young men should do all the digging, that we need to all study God's word and come to understand it for ourselves, but also recognize that light is going to come from, from other places, especially when it comes to this work at the end of the world. I don't have a view that this movement is all God is doing. God is working all over the world in different ways with different people using the abilities that those people have to spread the truth. And so the idea that this somehow, this movement is it, I've never taken that position. I believe that God is using all kinds of different people. This movement has a role and a purpose, but so do these other people that God is using. Anyway. Other more mature minds should go on with it, willing to receive every ray of light that God shall send, though it should come through the humblest of his servants. Um, so that's manuscript 15, 1888. Within their lifetime, the everlasting gospel should unfold in a mature and complete whole, ready to lighten the earth with the glory of truth. Now, we know that that didn't happen. And we know that we have a repeat of history and this movement is part of that repeat of history. And it's going to, to grow in some way. We don't know exactly how God is going to accomplish his work in this world, but we're not the only one studying this message of, of the repeat of Millerite history. There's lots of other people studying it. Some who have been connected with Jeff in the past and, and some who've just found it on their own, but it's, it's being understood and studied. So we know that lighting in the earth with the glory of truth, this is, is um, a reference to, of course, Revelation 18, right? 
If this was God's purpose, it would be necessary that the views of both Wagner and Jones should not be perfect or mature at this early stage of development. They were merely to challenge their brethren to the greatest treasure hunt of the ages. The very imperfections and immaturity of their views would rally the heart, the hearty cooperation of their brethren. Had the two young men seen all the light in its perfection, where would have been the joy in their uh, brethren in the sheer delight of discovery? God in his infinite mercy would share it among them. It was this gracious privilege that the brethren scorned, taunting the pioneer miners of hidden veins of truth with being fanatics and extremists. To suggest that the messengers, even at Minneapolis, were unstable, in danger of being carried away with their extreme views, casts an unjustified aspersion on Ellen White herself. Would she not be naive if she endorsed young messengers so untruth trustworthy? She almost recklessly risked her, risked her reputation on enthusiastic and persistent support of their message. Could the Lord choose messengers so unstable? Would he endow them with a message so potentially self-destructive? Is it dangerous to yield to be to yield to be the Lord's messenger? Surely God's mercy is greater than to endow his servants with self-destruct messages. We must note br briefly how in several general conference assemblies, speakers have openly recognized that the anti-1888 spirit included virtual defiance of Ellen White's ministry. Uh, what did the brethren in their, that fearful position in which they stood reject at Minneapolis? They rejected the latter rain, the loud cry of the third angel's message. Now, this is Jones, of course. Uh, brethren, isn't that too bad? Of course, the brethren did not know they were doing this, but the spirit of the Lord was there to tell them they were doing it. Was it not? But when they were rejecting the loud cry, the teaching of righteousness, and then the spirit of the Lord by his prophet stood there and told us what they were doing. But then, oh, then they simply set this prophet aside with all the rest. No one in the session, congrega session congregation challenged him for all knew that what he said was true. At the 1986 Annual Council in Rio de Janeiro, Robert W. Olson of the White Estate also stated that in the 1888 session, Ellen White was publicly defied. In 1889, she said, Elder Butler presented the matter before me in a letter stating that my attitude at that conference, 1888, just about broke the hearts of some of our ministering brethren at that meeting. Since some of my brethren told me in the light they do that my judgment is no more value than that of any other or of one who has not been called to this special work and that I am subject to the influence of my son Willie or some others, why do you send for Sister White to attend your camp meetings or special meetings? I cannot come. I could not do you any good. And it would only be trifling uh, with the sacred responsibilities the Lord has laid upon me. To have these words distorted, misapprehended by unbelievers, I expect, and it is no surprise to me, but to have my brethren who are acquainted with my mission and my work trifle with the message that God gives me to bear, grieves his spirit and is discouraging me. My way is hedged up by my brethren. Of course, not all the brethren opposed her so, but open support for her was inconspicuous. The Lord's humble messenger realized at Minneapolis what was happening. The larger blessings of the latter reign caused former friends to change their attitude from positive to negative. God did not raise me up to come across the plains to speak to you. And you sit here to question his message and question whether Sister White is the same as she used to be in years gone by. Then you acknowledge, then you acknowledge that Sister White was right, but somehow, it has changed now, and Sister White is different, just like the Jewish nation. Um, in 1893, she said, the office of a messenger whom God has chosen to send with pr proofs and warnings is strangely misunderstood at the present time. That's Review and Herald, July 18, 1893. Now, of course, we all know that Ellen White was in Australia, and, and she was exiled to Australia. That's not as well known. 
so determined was the post-1888 opposition to Ellen White that the General Conference virtually exiled her to Australia. Well, it is true that the Lord overruled her sojourn there for the good of his cause in that continent. It was never his will that she go at that time. She says that the Lord wanted the inspired trio to stay together in America and to fight the battle through a bit through to victory. Her own writings indicate that the leading brethren wanted both Ellen White and Wagner out of the way. Now, actually, I believe, too, that if Ellen White had stayed in America, that the story of Jones and Wagner might have been different as well. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail right now, but I do believe that by getting her out of the way, it actually uh, weakened Jones and Wagner uh, spiritual experience. It is well known that Mrs. White went only because the General Conference appointed her to go, a laudable example of cooperation with the church leadership. In 1896, she wrote very frankly to the General Conference president, the Lord was not in our leaving America. He did not reveal that it was his will that I should leave Battle Creek. The Lord did not plan this, but he let you all move after your own imaginings. The Lord would have had uh, W.C. White, his mother, and her workers remain in America. We were needed at the heart of the work, and had your spiritual perception discerned the true situation, you would never have consented to the movement made. But the Lord reads the hearts of all. There is so great a willingness to have us leave that the Lord permitted this thing to take place. Those who were weary of the testimonies born were left without the persons who bore them. Our separation from Battle Creek was to let men have their own will and way, which they thought superior to the way of the Lord. The result is before you, is, is before you had, the result is before you, had you stood in the right position, uh, the move would not have been made at this time. The Lord would have worked for Australia by other means, and a strong influence would have been held at Battle Creek, the great heart of the work. There we should have stood shoulder to shoulder, creating a helpful atmosphere to be felt in all our conferences. It was not the Lord who devised this matter. I could not get one ray of light to leave America. But when the Lord presented this matter to me as it really was, I opened my lips to no one because I knew that no one would discern the matter in all its bearings. When we left, relief was felt by many, but not so much by yourself. And the Lord was displeased, for he had set us to stand at the wheels of the moving machinery at Battle Creek. This is the reason I've written to you. Elder Olson had not the perception, the courage, the force to carry the responsibilities, nor was there any other man prepared to do the work the Lord had purposed we should do. I write you, Elder Olson, telling you that it was God's desire that we should stand side by side with you to counsel you, to advise you, to move with you. You were not discerning. You were willing to have the strong experience and knowledge that comes from uh, no human source removed from you, and thus you revealed that the Lord's ways were miscalculated and overlooked. This counsel was not considered a necessity. That the people of Battle Creek should feel that they could have us leave at, that, at the time we did was the result of man's devising and not the Lord's. The Lord designed that we should be near the publishing houses, that we should have easy access to these institutions that we might counsel together. Oh, how terrible it is to treat the Lord with dissimulation and neglect, to scorn his counsel with pride, because man's will, wisdom seems so much superior. So that's a letter to O.A. Olson, page 127, 1896. Those who say that the 1888 message was accepted by the leadership of the church may interpret Ellen White's years in Australia as general conference cooperation with the Holy Spirit. It is true that she was able to write good letters back home, but depriving North America of her personal ministry at this critical time ensured in a great measure the eventual defeat of the beginning loud cry message. E.J. Wagner suffered a similar exile in being sent to England in the spring of 1892. And there's no evidence also that it was not pure missionary zeal that sent him. 
Ellen White was now gone. The second member of the special trio must also leave. We note the following in Gilbert M. Valentine's doctrinal thesis on W.W. Prescott. According to W.C. White, Mrs. White, who apparently still had memories of the injustices of the post-1888 period, stated that it had been shown to her that whereas some of our people were well pleased to have him, E.J. Wagner, removed from the work at Battle Creek by his appointment to work in England, he should be brought back to assist as a teacher in the heart of our work. So this is uh, Willie White to A.G. Daniels, uh, May 30th, 1902. Um, anyway, a year before Ellen White went to Australia, she poured out her heart in a letter to J.S. J. S. Washburn, a young minister. Here, like Jeremiah, she writes almost in despair. She vividly describes the prevailing climate at the headquarters in Battle Creek. I attend meetings in the small churches, but I feel I have no strength to labor with the church who have had my testimony so abundantly. And yet those who have set themselves against my message and have not been moved to change their position of resistance, notwithstanding all the Lord has given me to say in demonstration of the spirit and power. I have no hope. I have no hope could be helped. I have I have no hope could be helped by anything I should say further. So anyway, it's a kind of awkward, that long, long sentence. But anyway, uh, they have resisted the appeals of the spirit of God. I have no hope that the Lord has a reserved power to break down their resistance. I leave them in the hands of God. And unless the Lord places upon me a decided burden to speak words in the tabernacle at Battle Creek, I shall not attempt to say anything until those who have acted a part to hedge up my way shall clear my path. I have not strength to contend with the spirit and resist doubts and unbelief which have barricaded their souls that they could not see when good cometh. I have far greater liberty in speaking to unbelievers. They are interested. Oh, it is the hardest place in the world to speak where great light has come, has come to men in responsible positions. They have been enlightened, but have chosen darkness rather than light. You may depend I have great sorrow of heart. What will be the end of this stubborn unbelief? We have yet to learn. Um, okay. Now he's going to go into, um, I'll, I'll read this here. I'll do the 19, 1890s have a message for the 1990s, right? So if we look back, obviously it, it's true. And especially when we think about 1989. So when we think about, um, what happened in that history, 1888, and, and what followed, and that rejection, we have, that is, the second generation from 1888 to 1919, right? And then you're going to have from 1919 to 1957, uh, the third generation, and then you're going to have the fourth generation um, from 1987, which is, we're in the fourth generation. So at this time, when this is being agitated in the 1980s, this issue of righteousness by faith, God is going to raise up Jeff to understand the repeat of Millerite history. So definitely the 1890s have a message for the 1990s. Ellen White's ministry to the Seventh-day Adventist Church frequently exhibits this Jeremiah-like quality. The ancient prophet's message is present truth. The 1888 episode is a parable and God will test us again. Right? And so... Of course, Wheelan and Short don't recognize what they're saying because they're before 1989. They're not really going to have a part in in this repeat of the first and second angels messages. But we can look back and see this. Because the facts of our 1888 history have been so widely garbled, our contemporary attitude is still unappreciative of Jones and Wagner's work. We still are suspicious lest their message may lead to fanaticism. We still falsely assume that it carried the two messengers away into apostasy. As long as we think thus, should the Lord send any more pearls of truth to be cast before us, we would be obliged to react to such a message as did the opposition of the 1888 era. So Wheeland, in short, um, really believed that the, that the church needed to re repent, this idea of corporate repentance. In order for the work to, to be accomplished, it that would have to happen. Has that happened? 
will it happen? We would have to say no, right? The church is not going to repent of their sin of 1888. Instead, what God did is he raised up another messenger to repeat the first and second angel's messages so that the third angel's message could be empowered, right? Because it's the second angel's message that joins with the third to empower it. And that's this history that we are in. We today inherit no genetic guilt of our forefathers who rejected the grandest opportunities of the ages, the beginning of the latter rain and the loud cry, but we are their spiritual descendants. Uh, Holy scripture teaches no genetic transmission of sin, original or otherwise, from generation to generation. But there is a transmission of sin which is not genetic. By one man sin entered the world, sin abounded, and hath reigned unto death. All the world has become guilty before God. This mysterious transmission of sin is clarified for us in the following statement. Now, there's lots I don't actually like about what he's saying, but I don't really want to go into it right now. The only thing I can say is that part of this belief that, that was in conservative Adventism the idea now, obviously, original sin, you know, when they talk about original sin, the idea is that because we inherited sin from Adam, this is the doctrine of original sin from the Catholic Church, that that we can never stop from sinning. Now, we know that's not true because Christ took upon himself our nature and its fallen condition. So there must have been some kind of genetic transmission of sin, Right. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have to become a man, right? He became a man, and when he became a man, he was made to be sin. So I don't buy into this idea uh, that no sin is transmitted. And I actually ca- like to call it uh, original guilt. That is, every one of us is born condemned, born guilty, even if we have never sinned. And that is, even if we never sin, we can still experience guilt. Because Christ experienced guilt. Did he sin? No. So why did he experience guilt? By taking upon himself our nature that has guilt in it. So I don't, I don't agree with this idea, but I also don't agree with the idea that original sin or original guilt or whatever you want to call it means that we can't overcome sin. But that wasn't the approach that was used in the 1980s and, and with conservatives since then to address this issue. And they misread what Jones and Wagner say about it. So I don't want to go into it more now. We'll go into it more when we deal with uh, the two books in Galatians. So anyway, we're going to read this uh, this idea about uh, guilt. At its very source, human nature was corrupted. And ever since then, sin has continued its hateful work, reaching from mind to mind. Every sin committed awakens the echoes of the original sin. Mutual dependence is a wonderful thing. Uh, Reciprocal influence should be carefully studied. That's quite quite a a sentence. Mutual dependence is a wonderful thing. Reciprocal influence should be carefully studied. Every generation takes up some phase of evil in advance of the one which preceded it, moving onward in the march of impenitence and rebellion. God is looking on, measuring the temple and the worshipers therein. No man liveth to himself. Consciously or unconsciously, he is influencing others, either for good or evil. It is not time that a people stood. Is it not time that a people stood forth in moral independence, cherishing at the same time a sense of their dependence on God? The Lord has sent to our world a message of warning, even the third angel's message. All heaven is waiting to hear us vindicate God's law. Now, one of the things you see here in the statement, when Elway talks about the third angel's message, she, when she says the third angel's message is righteousness by faith and verity, she's not saying the third angel's message is just righteousness by faith. Because this, the third angel's message is all about the Sabbath and Sunday, right? It's about God's law. So um, there's lots in this. And also she can, every sin committed awakens the echoes of original sin. So there's things in here. I, I probably we should look at the whole article, but um, we don't have time to right now. We have more light than had our forefathers. Hence, we have greater responsibilities. The heart alienation from Christ that caused the rejection of the 1888 message is today far more subtle. 
more sophisticated, more deeply buried beyond our consciousness. Um, but it is no less real. Only the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit will make it manifest. The time must come at last for each of us when the cross will be presented and its real bearing will be seen by every mind that has been blinded by transgression. Before the vision of Calvary with its mysterious victim, sinners will stand condemned. Would it not be a blessing if we could see that cross today before it is too late? And that, of course, is what we're experiencing as Christians. Every ray of light that comes to us carries with it a cross. The Holy Spirit enables the sincere believer to see himself or herself reflected in Bible characters of long ago. He can likewise enable us to see ourselves in our forefathers of a century ago. We are innately no better than they. The Holy Spirit can heal us of the blindness that permits us to see evil if it is sufficiently far-fetched and distant in the past. Um, while we fail to recognize it under our very nose, God's word has been true from the very beginning. So, and I'm just going to read this so we get to the conclusion here. Without the enlightenment of the spirit of God, we shall not be able to discern truth from error and shall fall under the masterful temptations and deceptions that Satan will bring upon the world. We are near the close of the controversy between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. And soon the delusions of the enemy will try our faith. Of what sort is it? So his conclusion here, uh, to realize the truth that our forefathers insulted the true Christ and the Holy Spirit is not itself bad news. And to unveil the reality of deep-seated resistance to the testimony of Jesus is a blessing. In no other way than facing truth can we prepare for future tests. The truth is positive, upbeat, encouraging. The good news is that heaven has all along been more willing to grant the final outpouring of God's spirit than we have thought. It's only our continued resistance, often unconscious, that has hindered the gift now for nearly a century, despite our prayers for it. To face the truth honestly has to be a source of joy. The stability and progress of the organized church can only be blessed by it. So we can see that there's stuff that's prescient in, in what they're saying for their time. It really speaks to our time. And the question is, are we going to be changed by the truth and the light that God has given us? Are we going to participate in this work that is the Lord's, not man's? And that the first place we participate is in our own hearts. You know, it's wonderful all the things God shows us in chronology and, and all the things he's shown us in the Bible. But if it doesn't change us, it'll be a curse more than a blessing. We can see this. You know, one of the things, just getting back to what we talked about at the beginning with Jeff speaking up 1260 days after July 18th. I didn't watch the whole thing, but and somebody said that, you know, uh, Daniel Fontenot says he's glad that we're not going to be dealing with numbers anymore. Well, remember back in, in December 6th of 2020, when the declaration uh, was published by FFA and the rejection of July 18th, and we had Daniel Fontenot supporting July 18th. Yeah, but is, is he going to support it today? Right? You know, can we just continue to reject God's light? No, no. We, we can't afford to. God has been leading us, and it has presented to us a cross that many do not want to carry. Human nature shrinks from that cross. This is not an intellectual issue, it is a heart issue. I mean, often I deal with the intellect when I'm presenting. I present ideas and scriptures and verses. But those who accept the truth, it's not going to be because of their intellect. It's going to be because of their desire to be changed. Because they see themselves as a sinner and they're willing to see themselves as a sinner. Because of the love that Christ has for them. Because they know they're accepted in the beloved. And, and that's the way in which God's love changes us. It, it allows us to face the truth. If I didn't know God loved me, there's no way that I would be willing to look at anything in me that is unchristlike. 
I would have to hide all of my sins from this tyrant God. But once you know God, you realize that he is there to help you, that the pain that you experience by coming to the light is worth it, even though it's going to be difficult. And many times we will shirk, you know, shrink back from that light. We will not want to receive it. But God is not finished with us. He's continuing to do this work. And and so, you know, we need to pray for one another. We need to pray for those in this movement, those that have been in this movement. But most of all, we need to pray for ourselves. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? One little thought based upon Mm -hmm. the comment that was made about not having to deal with numbers. Yeah. The question that runs through my mind is this then a direct rejection of Palmoni? Well, yes, it is. This is the, the thing I think that all of us need to be very careful on and in regard to, because we cannot afford to reject the light that has come from Palmoni. Which is Christ. Exactly. Because if we are, if we are rejecting it, are we then also not rejecting the very essence of his character? Well, yes. I mean, that's the whole thing about light. Like God gives us light in each generation in a different way. I mean, in our generation, well, let's say in 1888, you know, they don't have Christ there as a person and they're, you know, rejecting him and nailing him to a cross. Right. That's not the test for them because they would have seen that test. But it comes in another way. And for each of us and in each generation and in this movement, in these lines, God has chosen uh, to use numbers as a witness. And one is because of their objective nature. Right. That mean, they're intellectually in, in, a, in a time in which men live in skepticism and, and subjectivism. God has given us something so objective. It's impossible to deny. You have to deny reason in order to reject what God has done in this movement. And so, yes, it, it, it is the test that's given to us at this time. Are we going to accept that the light God has given us through the chronology of the Bible, through numbers, you know, if we're going to reject Christ, that it, we're crucifying Christ afresh. So, And that is a very fearful thought. Yeah. And, and the God has given us this light too, to help us. Right. I mean, for me personally, I mean, I can only speak of myself. I don't think I would have ever seen uh, my spiritual condition if it wasn't for what we've gone through in this movement. Because it's easy to fool yourself that you're better than you are. And God still has a great deal of work to do in my life and in all of our lives so that we learn to just depend upon God himself and not upon our own intellect, understanding, or what we perceive as righteousness. It has made us very dependent upon Christ what we have experienced, even the rejection, those things I take as a blessing. And the trials that I face each day, those are a blessing because they make me depend upon Christ. And that's what this movement should be doing is depending upon Christ and trusting him. Christ is taking the work into his own hands and we are being a part of that work as we yield to Christ. And that's, that's basically all there is to it. Okay. So, Well, let's close with prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the study this evening. Thank you for the Sabbath. We pray for those that watch this video and that they will see Christ in him crucified, that they will recognize the cross that is being offered, which is Christ's cross, um, that we can partake of it and that the sins that lie in our hearts deep inside can be removed and that we can reflect your character. Be with each person. May your angels watch over them. May you bless them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.